Howdy, Heroes Hearth. Kyle Ferguson here from Into the Nexus Podcast, and I want to tell you about my favorite Diablo build, which has even more viability now that May is in the game. I also want to talk to you about It Depends. And my favorite Diablo build takes advantage of a very rarely picked level 4 talent, Life Leech. A look at that win rate. This is the number one win rate build for Diablo in the game currently. But no, I just tricked you. See, it depends, because there are very few games played with this particular build. The classic Shadow Charge Domination build is way more popular, with a slightly lower win rate. But we can also say, it depends. The players that are winning with this build are taking it in very particular situations where it will succeed, where it will shine. And that's what I want to show you. Life Leech allows a level 4 Diablo to gain one soul and heal for 1.5 of his maximum health when basic attacking an enemy hero, while at 100 souls, increase the healing to 3% of his maximum health. Is this about making Diablo an auto attack damage machine? Not really. His DPS is okay, but it does give us massive survivability if there's someone we can attack regularly. If there are heroes in this game who maybe deal low damage, stand around in the front line for extended periods of time. I may have already hinted at one of them. Then at 7, with that target in mind that you're able to regularly auto attack, you can add on Diabolic Momentum, where Diablo's basic attacks against enemies reduce the cooldown of his basic abilities by 1.5 seconds. What you're doing is using the enemy tank or immobile hero as a battery, as a way to sustain yourself while you absorb damage, absorb those shots, those leaming orbs that would rather fly into your back line, heal through, and have low cooldowns to engage those backline heroes who are harassing you. Because of this build, because of noticing this opportunity, Diablo has become my number one counterpick to Johanna. Weird, right? But Johanna just kind of sits on top of the enemy team for an extended period of time, my team, where I can use her as this battery for souls, for cooldowns, while I look to engage the backline. Now with the addition of May, there is yet another low damage hero with slow disruption who likes to sit on top of the enemy frontline. And no, I don't care about blinds here, because if Johanna or May blind me, that's a blind that's not on my backline. Those are the two heroes, though, May and Johanna. I would never do this into Malganus, Garrosh, ETC. They're too disruptive for my positioning. They're wiggling around all the time. They're not going to stand and fight and give me that battery to use with this particular build. Let's get into the build rundown, and then we'll return to the it depends part of the conversation. I'm also going to skip level one here because... It depends. We'll talk about it in a moment. So level four, you're going to grab that life leech. So here I have my Johanna in range, who's battling over the tribute on Cursed Hollow. We are getting souls off of her. She's dancing around. She's trying to control my backline. Everything she does is on a slight delay. Johanna's Condemn is not instant. Her level 10 Blessed Shield takes time for her to aim. So at any point during this battle, I could engage on our enemy back here, and whether that's Li Ming or Hanzo or whoever happens to be weak in the back line, I'm ready to dive on them at a moment's notice. Hopefully my team follows me up, maybe we get the kill just being ourselves Diablo, and we can go back to farming on our slow frontline, Johanna or May. This also applies to Diabolic Momentum. We are farming on the enemy tank who's nice and stationary, moving very little. And at any point, we engage on that back line and we try to get a kill with help of our allies. As they teleport, jump around, the back line escapes, we return to farming on Johanna, and we've got another charge and whole set of abilities ready for that next charge and engagement. Now, of course, remember to weave some auto attacks as you do your stuns. There's no reason not to get a little bit off this guy as well. Zooming past 10 because it depends. Cruelty. Stunning an enemy hero with Shadow Charge or Overpower increases Diablo's attack speed by 50% for 7 seconds, up to 100%. 
Seven seconds is a long time in a MOBA. So with this talent, when you get two stuns, you gain 100% attack speed, which we're going to use to equal cooldowns, health, and souls if you need them. Look at him go. Now, of course, we can return to our Johanna tank, our May tank, and continue to sustain ourselves, get those cooldown reductions until we do it again. And heck, we might even be able to do this again just off the character here. At level 16, Overpowering Nightmare, gain an additional two charges of overpower with a two second countdown between each use. This now gives you the ability to juggle for that attack speed. Now that two second countdown is not affected by diabolic momentum, but the real power of this is you can have massive CC for things suddenly like Tracer or keeping Hanzo away from accessing a wall by working him into a new area. You are now capable of massive amounts of peel as well. Let's say you've got Nilladin down here below our Johanna harassing your back line. Well, you can pick him up, stun him. He dives over you, pick him back up. Continue to apply pressure, pick him up. This is also really useful on Fury Varian, positional heroes like Ragnaros. Feed on the tank, engage the back line, return to your front line, and now you have peels as well. This all works because Johanna and May are slow to do their CCs and they're avoidable with Diablo's movement. You are going to have a lot of fun with this build and May and Johanna are such popular tanks right now, there's a very good chance you're gonna get to use it. But let's talk about some of those it depends because at level one, we already have a choice to make between Feast on Fear and Devil's Do. Feast on Fear, stunning an enemy hero with Shadow Charge or Overpower, heals Diablo for 12% of his maximum health over three seconds. The sad thing about this talent is that that 12 doesn't stack. You always reset to a 12% heal. If you stun too quickly, you won't get three seconds of 12% health. You'll probably equal something more like 15% maximum health, but it allows you to make quick, deep engages while having a strong heal and in the late game, you can juggle for absurd amounts of self-healing. Devils do, your trait also increases the effectiveness of regen globes and healing fountains. This also affects mana. The reason that becomes important is because diabolic momentum, if used in these excellent ways against Johanna and May, you're gonna run out of mana. You go feast on fear? Well, you may wanna consider malevolence particularly because you're going to be engaging deep and malevolence is going to give you bonus damage to get rid of those back lines. The big choice you're making here between Devil's Do and Feast on Fear is fight time. How long the fight is going to last. Are you going to need that mana? Are you going to have access to orbs or a well in the middle of it? Feast on Fear is great for sustaining yourselves in deep, quick fights, but you will run out of mana. This is a pretty simple choice structure, but a lot of people don't vary their talents based on the game. Builds only work in certain situations. And if we think about a Hellfire build option, if we think about diverting to more damage with a Shadow Charge build after 13, if we make the choice at 7 that we're going to play differently with Malevolence rather than Diabolic Momentum, our play style is always changing to increase the chance we win. But it depends is not about randomness. It's not about a lucky game. It is about observing the battlefield and seeing what sort of advantages you can get over your enemy. We want to dive backline targets, not just feed on Johanna and May the whole time. So things like Li Ming, Hanzo, Vala are often exposed near walls. We can isolate them, we can attack them, and interrupt their DPS heavily with this build return to Johanna and do it again when they've repositioned. Our post-13 build is extremely effective against melee, particularly mobile melee who harass our line. And when we get in the game, we're still debating this build. We can still go a shadow charge build after 10 if we realize the team needs more damage. There's a lot of people here as the storm who swear by one particular build per hero. And there are those heroes who do have very particular builds in order to optimize their power. But most of these are a fluid process, 
analyzing from the start of the game as to how much damage you think you're going to do, analyzing the middle of the game as to what heroic is going to be the most effective, and analyzing the late game to see how you can recover or continue to punish the enemy team. Go enjoy this build. I've certainly been loving it. And I encourage you, if you're going to talk about your build online, make sure you say what it's for and very particular about what it's for, because it's likely very, very bad at dealing with certain situations. What is your favorite niche build? What sort of situations do you whip out your specialty in? Be sure to like and subscribe here at Heroes Heart and ring that bell as well. I'll see you next week with more Learn to Play content for Heroes of the Storm.